Are you looking for a new job? Are you hiring but struggling to find diverse, talented candidates? Then we have something that can help, our job board. Head on over to revisionpath.com forward slash jobs to browse listings or to place your own. This week on the job board, NWEA is looking for an experienced design lead for school improvement services. This is a six-month contract to hire position, and it's open for remote candidates as well as those in Portland, Oregon. And MoneyThink is looking for a product designer in the San Francisco Bay Area. For just $99, you can post your job listing with us where it will be on our job board for 30 days, and we'll spread the word for you about your job to our diverse audience of listeners. We also offer annual job board subscriptions. Make sure to head over to revisionpath.com forward slash jobs for more info on these listings. Apply today and tell them you heard about the job through Revision Path. Get started with us and expand your job search today. Revisionpath.com forward slash jobs. You're listening to the Revision Path Podcast, a weekly showcase of the world's black graphic designers, web designers, and web developers. Through in-depth interviews, you'll learn about their work, their goals, and what inspires them as creative individuals. Here's your host, Maurice Cherry. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Revision Path. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm your host, Maurice Cherry, and before we get into this week's interview, I just want to remind you again about our annual audience survey. Now, this is our 400th episode, and Revision Path has been in these podcast streets for over eight years now, which is a lifetime in this industry. As we've grown as both a show and a platform, we've always taken in audience feedback for topics, for guests, and for pretty much anything else. So whether you're new to the podcast or you happen to be an old fan, we want to hear from you. Head over to revisionpath.com forward slash survey to take this year's audience survey. One lucky respondent is going to win a $100 Amazon.com gift card. Now, the survey will end on May 31st, and we'll also tweet about the survey and put it on Instagram and have a link to it in the show notes for all of the episodes for this month. Again, that's revisionpath.com forward slash survey. Now let's take some time out and thank our accessibility sponsor for this episode, Brevity & Wit. Brevity & Wit is a strategy and design firm committed to designing a more inclusive and equitable world. They accomplish this through graphic design, presentations, and workshops around IDEA, Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Accessibility. If you're curious to learn how to combine a passion for IDEA with design, Check them out at brevityandwit.com. Brevity and Wit. Creative excellence without the grind. All right, let's get to this week's interview, which is our 400... Well, it's not our 400th interview. It's our 400th episode, but we've gone a little bit over 400 interviews. But anyway, I have had the privilege to talk with the one and only Brent Rollins, designer, author, creative conductor, and one of the co-founders of Ego Trip. Let's start the show. All right. So tell us who you are and what you do. My name is Brent Rollins. And the short answer is that I'm a multidisciplinary designer. The long answer would be that I'm a creative who collaborates with people, organizations that are passionate and sort of driven in their mission to kind of spread their ideas and positivity to the world. and to sort of create guiding paths for people. How has 2021 been for you so far? You know what, man? 2021, I'm ready to go. Let's go. Let's do this. <laughs> 2020 was actually the year that I was like, let's do this. We are, let's, I'm, I'm ready to make some stuff happen. Uh-huh. And well, we know how, how that sort of ended up. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, so I think it's been, I think a lot of people, including myself, have been, sort of kind of bubbling and if you're driven and if you have ideas and you're creative you've been using this sort of sabbatical or this time or this kind of slower period to think about things and formulate things and and come up with ideas and plan you know like the people that have passed unfortunately like i know a few people that have been affected by the virus and stuff so my heart goes out to them but for those of us who are alive 
this is a moment for us to be alive and to embrace that and to really like this is a blessing in, in, in that sense. If we haven't been devastatingly affected, this has been a blessing to have this moment to think about what we want to do and what we want to accomplish and, and to it's a forced introspection. And I think, you know, I hope rather that people kind of use it to better themselves. Right. So I, that's what I'm about, man. I can't wait for this year. I'm like, I'm ready to go. Yeah. I've talked to a, a lot of people that are saying that this is going to be like the new roaring twenties in a way. Oh man, is it ever? <laughs> it's going to be, yo, roaring twenties, baby boom. It's going to be crazy. I think like, <laughs> I think, you know, come June, July, it's going to be wild. bro. <laughs> yeah. No, and I mean, I think even now there's this sort of like, I can feel this renewed energy in the air, especially as people are starting to get the vaccine. And, you know, even as some places are starting to relax restrictions, like things are starting to open up again. And so people are are anxious to get back out there and, and experience the world, whatever that may look like. Yeah. I mean, you know, some people, unfortunately, continue to experience the world and they didn't really care. No shots, no, no judgment. Yeah. But. For the rest of us, hopefully, like I said, we're, we're sensible enough to kind of use it to our advantage and kind of make, make plans and, and sort of think about things. And, and it's really funny because at the top of 2020, I distinctly remember thinking, I can't tell you where I was, but I can distinctly remember thinking, I was like, man, the world is moving really fast. This thing needs to slow down. <laughs> it was like I felt how just how much stuff was going on because, you know, I live in New York city and, you know, I see like construction going on everywhere and I see all this stuff happening and it just felt like things were kind of out of control. And so it was, like I said, it's been a weird mixed, I guess, yin and yang kind of blessing that this thing sort of forced everyone to slow down. Yeah. What does a typical day look like for you now? It's funny because I was never a very structured person and I've become a little bit more regimented and I actually really enjoy it or I feel like I need that. So a typical day for me right now is I'm in this kind of like new cycle. So I'm actually implementing kind of new sort of regimens that I didn't really do. So I don't know how typical it is. It's only like maybe a four months old <laughs> you know, in terms of like this is Brent Rollins' day. But I typically go to sleep late just because I'm a night owl and I don't get much sleep. So I sort of wake up maybe about five or six hours later and kind of like, you know, I I, want to read and sort of see what's going on in the world and fix myself a little pot of coffee and and maybe take a little walk, get some air, get out the house, kind of uh, just sort of take in what the environment has to offer and start working on one of the multiple sort of projects that I got going on. And what are some of those projects? I mean, as much of them as you can sort of talk about at Liberty. Yeah, you know, it's really funny, like, because I was thinking about before this interview, I was like, man, you know what, I can't really talk about the things that I'm working on right now. Like, (laughs) not because they're secret, but I just, I don't want to get ahead of myself. A few of the things that are like, maybe like, projects for people Again, like people that are doing sort of very interesting sort of like uh, passion projects or things that have sort of a larger good. I think that's the kind of stuff that I can maybe talk about as far as like this is Brother Wajid, who is a sort of is a DJ based in Detroit, who is pretty well known. And Detroit, as you know, has an amazing music history. And so Wajid has got this fantastic opportunity to open, I don't want to call it a school, but he is spearheading this project to create a, I think it's called Underground Music Academy. It's sort of a place for people to sort of engage in in musical creativity. And it's on this boulevard in Detroit that has a lot of insane Detroit musical history. So I'm working on the identity for that. And I'm very excited about that. Some of the other projects that I'm working on are really entrepreneurial projects that have been in the works for the past year. One of them, you know, had to put the brakes on because of COVID, but is still moving and I'm super excited about it. And I really can't wait to sort of show the world what that's about. But it's, you know, the short story is that it'll be a sort of a restaurant or cafe or something. 
And and then the other project is another entrepreneurial project that I kind of don't want to talk about, but I'm also very excited about. Other than that, yeah, everything else is really like working on stuff for people for short films and and some album covers and, and things that are people that I've had creative history with, people that really want to kind of put something out into the world that's a little bit different. I'm at the point in my sort of life or career or however you want to talk about it or however you want to think about it, where I just want to be a little bit selective and I'm okay. I need to figure out, you know, everything has to, you have to make a a living, but I can be a little bit selective about things because I don't want to um, depend on those projects for the things to make a living. I'd rather have the entrepreneurial things be the things that I decide that I use to make a living. Okay. And, and that way I have more control over the creativity because it's my projects, mm-hmm. right? And then if I'm working with anybody, it's going to be because I really believe in what they're doing. There are people that have hit me up on or via social media. Man, people are like, yo, I'm doing this. Would you do an album cover for me? And I'm like, number one, you don't talk to people like that. You know what I mean? Like, I get <laughs> it. I also am like, you know, I'm not in your hustle, but I'm also... I want to lend myself to projects that I feel that I understand and I feel have some sort of worth and value and prove it to me. Yeah. It's interesting how Twitter, and I guess you could say social media as a whole, but it's amazing how Twitter has kind of almost flattened the hustle, like it's flattened the hustle in a way. Like Mm -hmm. people will talk to you on Twitter any kind of way. They don't care who you are. (laughs) They don't care who you are. And to that respect, I guess it's that way with social media in general. Like, they'll just approach you on, like, some, hey, can you do this for me? Like, I get so many people that will, I wouldn't even say that they write to the show. They tell the show, I don't know why you haven't interviewed me yet. (laughs) Who are you? Person with no website, and I can't tell what kind of work that you do, and you have 100 followers. Like, right? yeah, it's it's interesting how social media kind of... uh, flattens that in a way like people just don't approach you with the same kind of not necessarily gravitas but just like the same sort of urgency it's just like hey do this for me yeah yeah. you know well you know i mean people don't like i can get into my old man i'm gonna put my old man pants on right now (laughs) it's a little bit of number one you should just learn if you're gonna like i said if you're gonna approach people like show some respect if you really like their work at least be like, hey, I really like your work. This is what I'm trying to do. And come with some humility and be like, I'm doing this thing. Would you be interested in it? Yes, no. If not, I understand. I don't really appreciate this sort of informality. I think social media enables people to be in contact, right? Right. But it doesn't mean that you should abandon sort of what has been traditional decorum and sort of like, you know, just respect in terms of like how you how you approach yeah. people. You know, I, don't, I wouldn't talk to any of these kind of design heroes that I have as though they were my peers. They're not my peers. Those are people that I look up to and they're deserving of that respect. And and, and, and you're right. Yeah. As far as like flattening. I mean, I, I think most of the people or, or a large amount of people that are using social media, it is flat because they're all peers. Right. So they can mm-hmm. sort of approach people like that. But then there are other people that are within that space that are old like myself that are like, nah, man, this is not how you, you, you run up on folks. Like I, I didn't run up on people like that. I, I was very respectful. Uh, yeah. Respectful. But whenever I would meet people that were in a particular state, yeah. I mean, I would just approach them with humility, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's not that I'm like suggesting like, yo, I'm better than you, but I'm just kind of like, come on, man, I'm a grown man. Don't talk to me like that. Right. And also it's, it's clearly when they're, when someone's approaching in that way, like it's one way transactional, like what can I get? Oh yeah. Can you do something for me? Not like how do we help each other out in that kind of way? Yeah. Yeah. But you know what? I mean, if, if you've been doing anything for a moment and you have, and you're worth your lick of salt, you know, you can filter out who's real and who's not. Mm -hmm. That's true. And even, and even the people that are not, maybe they haven't found their tribe yet. But you can tell that, oh, you're looking. If you can identify the people that are like the junior use. Right. And, and like, oh, yeah, no, I, I get it. Yeah, this person, they're definitely on that vibe. And you know what? I'm going to put you under my wing because I can see that in you. And, you know, come along for the ride, homie. 
so yeah, I don't know, man, people have hacked up on social media. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned all these different, you know, kind of projects. And I, first of all, I have to say, I love the way you kind of just slyly was like, yeah, there's this DJ in Detroit, Wajid, like you're not talking about Wajid from Slum Village. No, 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 not at all. <laughs> <laughs> just like, yeah, it's this guy, you know, he's starting the school, doing the thing. Like, okay, all right. But when it comes to like all these different projects that you do, like what does your creative process look like when you're starting a project? There is depending on the project, but I think that like, you know, I do a little research depending on what it is. One of the things that I try to tap into where, you know, it's really funny because I have a great appreciation for sort of like, very learned kind of design approaches. But I think I'm really like a designer that came from an art background, I think, or just the, or more so just the act of creativity itself. And so I approach things in a way that's more about e- emotion. And uh, oftentimes, like, what is the feeling that I got when I encountered X, right? And so that's what I'm trying to tap into in terms of like that sort of intuitive sort of feeling. Like I'm sure like there have been moments in your life where there's been some maybe, you know, I'm going to just use music because it's such a common denominator. You know, when you, there was like maybe a club that you were just like, Oh man, that club was just, that was it because the DJ, like the music was just right. And the vibe was right. And the, the crowd and the, this and the, that, and the, you know, all those kind of things. That's a feeling, right? Mm-hmm. And if it's done right, there's a visual component to it as well. And so what I look towards is like tapping into that visual trigger. That's the thing that, that because that's my language. So mm-hmm. that's the thing that I, that whenever I was in, in, in any of these kind of environments, that's what I latched on to as my sort of like, this is my flotation device. You know, this is what's going to keep me up in this space. And I'm going to, I'm going to use this design thing or this visual thing. And I'm going to sit back on my floaty and chill while I'm observing the rest of the, the, the stuff that's going on. That's kind of like how I go. And it's, it's, it's the creative process is about tapping into that vibe, that thing, that emotion that people get that, that is very subconscious. If you've been to like the Caribbean or certain countries I don't want to say third world countries, but just developing countries or something. There's like the smell of like gasoline and, and burning jungle foliage. <laughs> you know? yeah. I was exposed to it as a young age. And then, you know, as an adult, I go back to those places and I'm like, oh, whoa. It's like it automatically it's something that I totally forgot about. Like, boom, it just triggered me. Mm-hmm. You know? and, and I was like, oh, I'm back here. I'm ready to roll. So that's what I'm trying to, trying to reach for is to think about those kinds of things. All right. So, yeah, you try to, like, tap into, like, a certain, you said, like, a visual trigger or a vibe or, like, a a feeling, and then you kind of build out from there, it sounds like. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's really funny, man. Their emotions and their memories, like I said, people don't necessarily, sometimes people don't remember them. But when they see them, they get excited, like, I love remembering things that I've totally forgot. There's sometimes there's a thing that maybe happened to me as a child or that maybe I went to and someone else will bring it up. And I'm like, Oh, Whoa. Oh man. I totally remember. Like, I love that. That's like the best feeling ever. Cause you're like, you're taken back to something that you had kind of like pushed in the, it's like in the, in the back of the, the storage room. You know, it's like if you've ever, if you have stuff in storage and you kind of go through things and you, you rediscover them. Like recently I was going through uh, my parents' garage and sort of cleaning things out and kind of came across like uh, two boxes of old comics that I had left behind when I, when I left the Los Angeles for New York. And, you know, I hadn't thought about those comic books in like 20 plus years. Right. Yeah. And I was like, Oh yeah, you know, I, I mean, it's not that I, you know, I knew that I had comics, but you know, I had got to the point where I just sort of dis, you know, disassociated and, and unattached myself to those as possessions. Comic books were really important to me. The stories and the the illustrations were, you know, some of the artists were very significant to me. And rediscovering those comic books, you know, in the back of my my dad's garage and kind of going through it, 
like man i i got a little i got a little teary eyed because like oh man a few comics i was just like oh man this because I, I decided to sell them you know i was like i haven't looked at these things in so long what, what's the point of these of keeping these things that i just sort of resolved to sell them yeah but I, was, I was going through some of the comics i was like man do i really get rid of this you know like oh this is so awesome and and it was like yeah i reconnected with something that i completely forgot about so yeah when i do <laughs> so take it full circle so when i did when i do design there's a tinge of nostalgia, I guess, in some of the things, because that's, I think that's what people are relating to in some cases. And then in other cases, you know, it's like, well, I want to do something completely new. And how do you do that? Even when you make something new, it's rooted in something, because if you do something that's too new, you lose people. So you want to put a little bit of something familiar in it, right? It's interesting you mentioned that sort of like tinge of nostalgia, because I feel like there's, you know, and we'll get into, you know, the work that you've done with ego trip and rap pages, et cetera. But like, there's a very temporal quality to your work that is kind of evocative of like the sixties and the seventies in Mm. different ways. I think one, there's this sort of like collage mixed media kind of thing that I see you do sometimes, but then there's also, and maybe I'm thinking of, of the more visual stuff that I see on television, but like, it's also like a nod back to projectors and, there's like an audio element of like a film reel or like noise grain that you see on film and stuff like that. And then just even the playful way that you use typography. Like it's, it's almost like you see those old school horror movie title cards or something. Like I get what you mean about that kind of like tinge of nostalgia, but I think that's a pretty big theme in your work though. Yeah. You know, I mean, the thing about using that as a device, it's funny because I don't know what I really want to talk to some younger designers now and kind of get where their head is at because when I would resort to those options, it's because that's what I know is familiar to people. And the idea of design in my world, design meaning kind of visual communications, graphics, that type of design, it's really about, I want to communicate with you. What's our shared language? You know, what are our shared memories? What is our shared sort of commonalities? And when I pull from those kind of things, this is very conscious. Those those are like things that I want to trigger you. I want you to be like, oh, I get it. Like, I think there's the idea of design as ornament and sort of fireworks where it's like, yo, I'm doing something new and this is avant-garde and you're going to get about five people that understand what you're doing, which is cool. I'm not against that. I love that kind of stuff. But the idea of design, my foundation or my understanding of of, of design is about is rooted in the old idea of what a graphic artist was, which was communication design. Mm. So the idea of like, I'm trying to reach you. I'm, I'm trying to talk with you. And the for me, the shortcut is shared experiences. For me, the shortcut is what I surmise as being the things that we grew up with. And that's how we begin to talk to each other. That's kind of where I'm coming from. When I was doing that kind of stuff, it was based off of, it's not the nostalgia because it looks, sometimes that nostalgia can be about the kitsch factor or whatever. Mm, um, okay. I can, man, I, I can go off on, on this. I, I, was, I was actually careful not to use the word kitsch. So I'm, I'm surprised you brought that up. Well, you know, it's sort of like the idea of like, well, when I say kitsch, I think like, Let's talk about like the 70s, for instance. And when okay. you see things that are about 70s, this, the, the 70s, and particularly black culture, it's always expressed in these very kind of superficial, simple, you know, it's like the lettering is groovy, whatever that means, <laughs> you know. And, Hobo standard kind of, I know what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you think of afros as, as kitsch. It's a little bit of kitsch, right? Like mm-hmm. people don't look at afros as... They don't look at Afros as what it was, which was like this assertion of black identity and being sort of proud of kinky hair and, and all this other kind of stuff. They look at it as being a style, right? Right. And, and how big it was, how large your Afro was. And the and sometimes there's this sort of – there's definitely like a silliness to, to some stuff from the 70s. I think that's the, the sort of kitsch thing, and it's, it becomes like this kind of joke like I think, I think about that movie, um, Black Dynamite, which avoided it because it was that movie wasn't a, like it took place in you know it took place in the seventies. Yeah, but it wasn't about Afro jokes. 
Right. I mean, it was, it was, but it wasn't. It was really like a very loving sort of understanding about that sort of aesthetic, but it was deeper than, than Afro jokes. I don't like Afro jokes that <laughs> I don't like Afro jokes. I'm, I'm going <laughs> to pound uh, my fist on the table. Yeah. It's, it's not about the kitsch of it. The kitsch isn't about, you know, it's, it's about like, Oh, I, I remember that vibe. And yeah. and yeah, that's what I'm trying to tap into. So you mentioned Los Angeles where you're originally from. Yeah. Uh, tell me what it was like growing up there. Oh man. What a weird place. (laughs) (laughs) I have a love and hate relationship with Los Angeles because it made me who I am. So I I can't hate on it. And there are some really beautiful things about the city. There are some other things that I didn't like because I grew up around the entertainment industry. And so it was just sort of like a a preoccupation that, yes, it generates, you know, it generates money and it generates attention. But sometimes I have to wonder why people sort of got into that world. But the world that I grew up in was a middle-class black neighborhood called Windsor Hills, which I love to say the Issa Rae's character on Insecure. She's from the neighborhood that I grew up. So, Uh you know, big up to that, to her. And when that show came out, I was just like, I just couldn't believe that anything was shot in my neighborhood. You know, (laughs) it just be like, I'm like, oh my God, they're shooting there. They're doing a, a scene there or some other place and it it just blows my mind. So it's, um, I have to admit, it's like a place that I'm very proud to come from, even though ironically, when I was growing up, I wasn't, it was very conflicting, you know, because it was a neighborhood that in the sixties, I would say was probably, it was, I think from what my understanding was predominantly white, predominantly, you know, a lot of maybe Jewish People who, who lived also in, in, in the neighborhood of Windsor Hills, View Park, Ladera Heights, Bowman Hills, that area. Mm-hmm. And I think as black people started, uh, you know, I like to say or not like to say, but uh, I kind of refer to like the 60s as being like when black people actually arrived in the United States. That was when actual opportunities started opening up in the same way that other immigrants sort of arrive in the United States and they kind of have to kind of uh, scrounge and kind of scrap their way. You know, they're at the bottom, but they still have this sort of legitimate way to sort of move on. In some ways, the 60s was kind of like that, finally being able to participate. And so a lot of folks who had been able to get like civil service jobs or other types of sort of middle class jobs started buying into the neighborhood that I grew up in. And so I think that was great to see some things I didn't necessarily like because I don't, I started, you know, I had problems with sort of the kind of class segregation that was apparent and less about money, but more about social segregation and the idea that, I don't know, the idea of society was was something that I kind of struggled with. Like I grew up around people that I want to make very clear, I'm not knocking something like Jack and Jill or those kinds of organizations. I think at the time, I wasn't part of those things and I didn't understand them at the time. Mm. So my limited understanding was this was just some weird bougie kind of whatever. I understand it or I have a better appreciation of it now in the sense of like, the way I like to think about it is if your parents, whatever sort of situation, your parents, regardless of the situation that they come from, they want something better for you. And so that sort of situation, it exists because they want their children to succeed or they want their children to have a guaranteed better life. But I didn't understand that at the time. And so even though my father worked in or rather was trying to make his way in entertainment during that time, um, we ourselves were not, uh, you know, probably as as well off as maybe the people that were around me. So that kind of gave me a different sort of perspective on things. Mm. I remember Jack and Jill growing up and I did think it was just some bougie black people. Like like (laughs) seriously. But then like I grew up, I mean, I grew up as folks who listen to the show know I grew up in, in Selma, Alabama. And it's like, at the end of the day, we're all poor black people in the country. Like I think when I was looking at it from sort of as like from a teenage perspective, and I don't know if it's this way for all of Jack and Jill, but it certainly was this way back back then in Alabama. It was by, you know, sort of social class, of course, but then also by skin color. 
like mm-hmm. pretty much everyone in Jack and Jill was light skinned and I am not. And it's like, I would have people say, well, you know, you would be so good at Jack and Jill, but you know, you know, <laughs> it's sort of like if, if you were just a few shades lighter, maybe. And, and this other thing that we had were like, and this was in, in high school. I don't know if this is even a thing or if this was just a thing endemic to our high school, but we had like these high school fraternities and sororities that were based off of like black fraternities and sororities. So you had like the mini alphas, Alpha Phi Alpha were the African Knights and like the mini AKAs, Alpha Kappa Alphas were Culturama and the mini Delta Sigma Theta were Del Teens. And I never understood any of it. Like, I mean, my mother was in a sorority. My mother's a Delta, but like, I didn't get it. Like, why are we doing this? This doesn't make any sense. You just, you're just sort of lording this imaginary social position over someone else for what, you know? Mm. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, I don't, again, like, I don't really understand the motivation for that. I could say that <laughs> as I've grown older, I, I don't want to say I've grown more bougie. <laughs> I'm not gonna say that I don't I'm not gonna say that I don't like nice things, let's put it that way. <laughs> but I don't really quite understand that point of view. An interesting thing that and I don't know how this connects really, but it come what comes to mind is I got the opportunity to work with Don Cornelius. Oh wow. And one of the things that he said to me was black people don't recognize class. Hmm. And which sort of defies what we're, we're talking about. Yeah. But in some ways, I understand what he's saying, because at the end of the day, in the United States, we're all black people. Right. We're all structurally, socially second class. Yeah. And so that's our commonality. And I don't know, I just thought it was a really interesting statement from him. You know, I think we or people in general, I don't know, sort of seek to separate ourselves. But Mm -hmm. uh, at least in the United States, you know, there's still this thread that we're all in the same boat. Yeah, I think in the South, certainly there was probably just an additional there may have just been an additional element of wanting to, I don't know, maybe have what white people had in some way. Sure. I, I wonder if that's part of it. Like, for example, like I mentioned, the. The high school fraternities, like we had both a cotillion and a botillion. I had a botillion. It was stupid, but like, like you, congratulations, uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> but you're That's like, it's, it's like, oh, you're a distinguished man of a certain age, and it's a whole thing with like they do a cakewalk, and you mm-hmm. have to be in a suit, a tux, actually, have to be in a tux, and. You do the waltz. It's so stupid. I don't know if if any other. I hope they don't still do that because when I think back on it, I'm like, this is like some midnight in the garden of good and evil kind of shit. Like, mm, this mm, is weird. Mm. I'm going to offer the inverse of that. I think that there's an opportunity to create expressions that are highly developed, mm-hmm. right? And I don't necessarily have a problem with that. I think that. To your point, when it becomes about emulating the surface aspects of white culture, then that's where it becomes problematic. But if you're celebrating the things that are great about your culture, I think that's a different point of view, right? Hmm. And maybe that's not that we're going to solve this problem or, or be able to put a suggestion box to Jack and Jill, but maybe that's how it transforms or or maybe there's some other organizations or people who are less about that that sort of take on things and more about like this is what's beautiful about black, about black culture and we should celebrate those things and we should aspire to those things i think that that's the thing is like there should be a quality and execution and decorum level that a lot of cultures have yeah right? that are had been sort of codified and sort of expected you know, like, you know, we were talking earlier about like, if I go to Japan or something like that, like, I expect Japanese design to be like kick ass, mm-hmm. right? Or even like Scandinavian design, I expect it to be pretty damn good. And so 
that's okay to me to be like, are you at that level? No, this yeah. is, you know, and when you reach that level, dope, we're going to really like, we're going to knight you, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like you did it. We have a sense of that with music in terms of like, it doesn't matter necessarily what genre it is. And even if you don't like it, you might be like, okay, I'm not really necessarily feeling this particular take, but I can tell that it's the person behind it. They put a lot into it. Yeah. You know, you know I think music is like one of the things that black Americans are that do very well and is worldwide considered to be of excellence. And we have grown up and been exposed to something of excellence that when it's time for, for those who decide to participate into that into those avenues, even when they're doing something new, they're trying to shoot for a particular bar. Right, right. right. And I think that like having those kinds of standards, absolutely. I think that like I see no problem in in that sort of higher culture participation. Does that make sense? That makes sense. I mean, certainly I get what you're saying about, you know, when you look at another nation's culture, for example, that you sort of, there's a certain expectation there. And I think that's because that, hey, that particular aesthetic, similar to what you're saying with like black people in music, like it's been distilled and exported in a way where you already have like a presupposition of what it's going to be before you even know what it is. Like if you order, like I'll give you an example. I ordered some pants from I forget what the it was like something I saw on Instagram that was probably my fault but I saw some <laughs> some dope pants on Instagram and I was like oh they're like some Japanese Maikito pants so I expect when I get them they're gonna have a certain like flattering cut or something different that maybe you wouldn't see with American you know apparel or something like that not the brand but just apparel in general and like for yeah. for black design I think that's a very that's a moving target in a way because it's going to depend yeah. on your experiences, where you grew up, where you like where you pull inspiration from. Like I just had a German American designer on the show, Julian Williams, who uh is currently in Amsterdam. Young kid, 25 years old, has done design work for Karl Lagerfeld, Nike, Tommy Hilfiger. Has like this very distinct bold graphic typographical design. But then he also like pulls inspiration from voguing and the ballroom scene that he's a part of. And so it's all a part of like his general like design aesthetic. Is that black design because he's a black designer? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. You know, but like that's what I'm saying. Like it's like a moving target because then you could look at you could look at your work and your work is definitely very steeped in, you know, like I said, these kind of references from the 60s and the 70s and this tie to nostalgia and a lot of what you have done has kind of set the, I feel like has set the visual cornerstone for like an entire culture. When people think of like hip hop design, like it comes down to a lot of the stuff that you did with Ego Trip, a lot of the stuff you did with Complex, like these very like interesting graphic styles. Like that also is black design. Yeah, that's the goal. I mean, like I said, it's not one, like or what you're alluding to, it's not one thing. Yeah, It's not one particular genre, but it is when you enter that space, it's going to be executed at a particular level. Mm -hmm. or it's going to be, uh, it's going to cover specific things. And there are sort of expectations that you get. Like jazz is totally different from R&B and is totally different from samba, is totally different from reggae, is totally different from dance hall, but it's all black music right? It's totally different from the blues. It's all black music. They all sound different, mm -hmm. right? But there's this thread of expression and commonality. And when these genres develop themselves, the execution is you can't deny it. So that's a goal is to create things that even though they're not in one particular space or they may jump from place to place, which is what's going to happen, you want them to to leave a mark. And and I would say, you know, speaking about how, you know, kind of having black design being internationally recognized in a way similar to how like black music is, a lot of your work has been exhibited, you know, in group exhibitions both here in the US as well as internationally. What does it mean to have your work kind of shown in that kind of fashion? 
when my stuff is recognized internationally, it means a lot because a lot of it was pre-internet. And that means that the people that decided to talk about design or whatever, they're seeking, you know, they're looking for, I mean, they're looking for content like anybody, like anything or anybody now, but they have a certain standard in mind and there's a filter that, that, that they have in their head. So what I'm proud of, I guess, is publications and people that have reached out to me, you know, like I said, particularly before the internet was popping because they were like, oh, I've seen this. I've seen a few of these things. I really was affected by this or this was um, a music artist that really meant a lot to me. And I see that a couple of other artists that mean a lot to me were represented by visually by this guy, Brent Rollins. And so let me look into it. That's a good feeling. And to know that people around the world who are on the same wavelength as you and who are seeking out things find you. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. That makes me feel good. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you know, we've we've talked about Ego Trip, you know, just kind of briefly touching on it, but I want to go more in sure. depth about that. You came on as art director, you're kind of one of the co-founders of of this group with like some titans in the industry, Sasha Jenkins, <laughs> yeah. Elliot Wilson, Jeff Mao. Like, take me back to that time. Like, what did it feel like sort of coming together and building something like Ego Trip and, and the work that you all were able to do? Oh, sure, yeah. And we have to remember the the one Titan who is always like never wants attention was Gabriel Alvarez. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, Ego Trip is kind of like a, we were like a band. And in some ways for that world, we were like a super group. And, you know, I got to know, you know, I started working with Gabriel Alvarez when I was working at Rap Pages, got the gig through a very awesome, incredible woman named Sheena Lester. And, uh, you know, so Rap Pages was an early sort of competitor to the Source magazine. And Larry um, Flint. Larry Flint. My man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, enough respect to that guy. Rest in peace. What a person to work for. Or, you know, <laughs> I didn't work for him specifically, but just to know that he was in the building. Like, what a very, very bizarre to be like, you know, early 20s and working for a pornographer. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, he had started this magazine, Rap Pages, basically to kind of, um, you know, kind of reap some attention in, from the, uh, you know, that the source was getting. And Sheena had taken it over uh, after maybe a few issues, I guess, and wanted to build, you know, an editorial team. I was one of the later people to join. And one of my compatriots there was Gabriel Alvarez. So between myself, Sheena, Gabe... Bilal, Dorothy, and uh, I apologize if I can't remember any, Hannibal and some other folks that, oh, Nikki, incredible person. We kind of were a little kind of group who kind of wanted to take on the source at the time. That was like the sort of main kind of hip hop music magazine, right? It was the first and undeniably significant, but we sort of had our take on things or whatever. So, but we had hired freelance writers and among them was Sasha Jenkins and Elliot Wilson. And I'm not sure if Mal, I believe Mal may have been hired as well um, as a freelance writer, but that's how I got to know those guys. And, or that's how I made first contact with them. And after a few years of working at the magazine, Gabe had uh, moved to New York to work with Sasha on Ego Trip. And Sasha Jenkins, who, for people that don't know, I would say like in recent years, he's probably known for producing these documentaries called, uh, I believe it's called like Fresh Dressed, which is about sort of like hip hop fashion. He uh, also directed this Wu-Tang documentary on Showtime. And so he's been, uh, and he's also in a, in a punk band and all this other kind of stuff. And Sasha has, has always been doing all these kind of, kind of great sort of self-started initiating things and had this sort of fledgling magazine or zine rather called Ego Trip. And Ego Trip was it was coming from the perspective of mainly mostly writers of color to talk about hip hop with a love and reverence but also an irreverence towards the subject matter and also 
had interests in other music, such as punk rock, indie rock, what have you. And so, as Sasha would say, it was like Rolling Stones, but the inverse. So Rolling Stone would mostly cover rock and maybe occasionally do hip hop. And so Ego Trip was the flip side of that. And so that's how I got to know those guys. And I eventually moved to New York in 1997 because of having some contact with Sasha. Sasha had sort of said, hey, we need to step up our magazine visually, you know, sort of invited me to sort of join the team for no money, (laughs) but more just out of like an outlet to do something creative. I looked at myself as the Terry Gilliam to everybody else's, you know, John Cleese and and, and the rest of the, the Monty Python crew. As far as like being the visual person, I understood editorial and also wanted to do sort of humor, humorous, you know, we were, we were doing a lot of kind of funny, goofy stuff. And so I had sort of like my take on how to express that. And eventually that became via collage. There were, the magazine itself was instrumental to me in terms of my creative development because it was very DIY. It was like, it was like, let's just take, you know, we used to do precursors to memes and, you know, called ego trip ads. So we would find these funny images from like Jet Magazine or or Ebony or something like that, just older magazines, like ads of like black people in Burger King ads and, and write sort of funny captions to them. But the captions were always like hip hop lyrics, right? And then we would kind of, you know, put the little slug like Ego Trip. And so basically they, they became ads to fill in the unused ad space in the magazine, <laughs> but they became, but they were fun and they were sort of like, they helped our, us sort of develop our creative voice and make the magazine more individual and, and sort of unique. And so, yeah, that's how I kind of got down with them was, was like, you know, I had myself this sort of irreverent take on, on hip hop and sort of like making fun of hip hop, but loving it at the same time. And this was the vehicle for it. And so we, once we got together, yeah, Sasha was working, I think at Vibe Magazine, Elliot was working at The Source, Jeff was writing for a lot of other music magazines and, and, and Gabe is the glue. And like I said, doesn't get the credit that he deserves because he's very much a behind the scenes, doesn't want the attention, but he is the funniest mf on the planet and super creative. And so collectively, yeah, we kind of just became like Voltron, like superhero group and looked at the magazine as a vehicle to express just like how we just things that we were interested in and, and, and also to try to put it to it like every, every album, every issue, I only did like the last three issues, but it, it felt like putting and make, making an album and each one, each issue got more and more personal. Like there's running, it's a magazine with literally, literally with like running jokes. Like there, <laughs> there's, if you, yeah. If you turn the pages, you'll see a reference to something that came earlier and we would just, we, we would made it, made it this kind of like goofy puzzle and it, it became semi everything in ego trip became this it it started blurring the line between music journalism and and autobiography Mm. how was it received at the time you know i think you'd have to ask a lot of journalists maybe how they thought about it i guess at the time no one was doing what we were doing and i don't say that to sound like arrogant i just mean in the sense no talk i mean hey talk your shit but but, but i'm I'm not trying to you know (laughs) It wasn't usual for people to get together to be like, hey, we want to talk about this with this particular voice that isn't straight ahead, right? Mm -hmm. So when we got together to do that stuff, we just had fun. We would just goof around and just make jokes. And it was like one of the, you know, those guys are like my brothers, like brothers that I never had. And so, like I said, it's kind of like we were sort of like a super group. (laughs) <laughs> yeah we used to do some stupid things <laughs> i'm trying to, in my head I'm, I'm thinking about this time we kidnapped this journalist wait 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 what yeah <laughs> yeah because so so there's this journalist who writes for the new york times now named john caramonica oh my god okay no i'm sorry go ahead go ahead go ahead wait do you know do you i know do you, of him because of some of his shitty reviews but no go ahead so I, I, you know, I can't remember what he was interviewing us for. Maybe it was for our first book. I can't remember. Probably 
But we were like, okay, this is how we, you know, we want to be legendary, right? So we, so at the time we used to have this one office on 16th Street, so the Chelsea Market, and we used to have this really dope, the, the fourth floor. We had it all, almost all to ourselves. We were sharing it with this graffiti brand named uh, Lords of Brooklyn, but they were never there. So, uh, so we kind of just had the run of the space, and then. For, for for reasons that I won't get into, we had to vacate that space. And so we ended up moving into the basement of the building, right? So we, we wrote our first book in the basement of this building on, on 16th Street in, in Chelsea. And so, you know, there, there were pipes above us and that, you know, you'd hear like the toilet flushing and you just hear like all this, you know, sewage like going by and stuff like that. And then we had this <laughs> room in the back. We only had like two rooms. We had this one room and that was where if you see the cover of our book, the book of rap list like that was that was the room that we we shot this in and we were like okay i guess we're going to get interviewed i think it was probably for the new york times and we're going to get interviewed and you know we can't just do a normal thing man we're like we're ego trip dude we're we're, we're the money python of this shit right so (laughs) so we we told him we told him to meet or show up someplace in the chelsea market which is like this kind of food court now this glorified food court like in chelsea and we had this really cute uh, girl who was a friend of ours go meet him, you know, and she was like, are you John Caramonica? You know, and she, you know, he's like, yes. She's like, come with me. You know, <laughs> so, you, know <laughs> we wanted that, you know, we wanted him to have a story to tell. Right. So, so she leads him. I, I can't remember if she, I, we weren't there, so I can't say exactly, but I believe she probably blindfolded him, you know, at this venue and probably walked him outside across the street and then, you know, walked into the building, took him downstairs, you know, in the elevator. He shows up. He's blindfolded. <laughs> we walked him into like... I'm still thrown at the fact that he just went with this woman and, and got blindfolded, just went with her. Yeah, man. You know, it's like, he, he, what, what is he going to do? Is he going to say no? You know, he's... he's That's he, true, yeah. You know, he, he just, he, he did it. So, um, it was just funny. So... <laughs> <laughs> See, you're saying kidnapping. I'm thinking like somebody got shoved in the back of a panel van or something. He sounds like a he sounds like a willing participant in this case. But go oh, go ahead, no. go ahead. Yeah, yeah but was, I can imagine that for someone in his position, it must have been definitely strange. <laughs> you know, he's not just going up to an office to talk to somebody. He's getting he's being blindfolded by some you know attractive young lady and and brought to who he doesn't even know where he's going. Right. right? Yeah. And this is the white van, as far as we're concerned. Right. <laughs> She takes him into the back room, and then we have the lights down low. <laughs> I remember Sa- I think Sasha and Mal, Jeff Mal, were back there. So we had turntables in there, and I, because I remember because I was in the other room. I just remember like Sasha had something. He he, was, he had some record on the on the turntable, and he kept looping it. So it was just super creepy. He was just scratching mm. and looping, like just back spinning it. You know, so, <laughs> super creepy thing right and, he, and, the, and then we instruct Caramonica to take off his blindfold and then you know the guys proceed to to talk with the the flashlight under their under their heads <laughs> wow <laughs> and then you know they have the, they, they do the interview and finally you know it's time to leave so I do remember Jeff going like so it's it's time to go and I do remember Jeff now going so like Hey, thanks. Thanks for coming by. You know what you got to do now, right? Yeah. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> he's like, yeah. So we asked our friend to, you know, the, the young lady to blindfold him again. And we spun him around a few times. And he wow. exited the building. And uh, the rest is history. <laughs> wow. That's, <laughs> that's a wild story. That's a wild story. So, I mean, Ego Trip, you know, eventually evolved from, you know, this magazine to a book to several television shows. You know, I mentioned prior to us recording how I I remember watching those shows on VH1 as a teenager, like The White Rapper Show and and Miss Rap Supreme and Raceorama and everything, and just being so... Well, maybe not so much the reality shows, but certainly the visual elements from like Racerama and stuff like that being so enamored with. I had never seen anything like that before talking about like black culture, hip hop culture, that kind of thing. Like I've never seen it done in that way. And it just like 
it blew my mind. I mean, it was really, you know, I have to say it was kind of an early design reference for me. Like I wanted to make stuff like that. So, like I wanted to be able to kind of have that sort of tongue in cheek irreverence towards, towards culture in that way. And in a way that felt familiar, but also felt kind of new and fresh, unlike something that you haven't really seen before. Oh man. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I think that was again, like the, for me, that was a little bit of the Terry Gilliam, you know, in terms of like all the crazy animations that you would see from Monty Python, Mm -hmm. Monty Python, that was my inspiration, you know, in the sense of like the humor of stuff and how do you express that stuff visually. And, you know, everything that we were doing in Ego Trip was really, it's funny because I'd like to think that we, I don't want to say that we originated things, but there definitely wasn't any sort of like bigger reference. And it's, it's funny how meme culture has years later sort of assumed some of the similarities to what we were doing. So is it a human thing? I don't know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, you know, it was, you know, in terms of like pairing these references and music lyrics to things and and doing so like tongue in cheek. But I don't know, but we definitely did it early. And so, yeah, for Race and Rama, each episode or there was three series, right? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, three episodes in the series. And Race and Rama was this kind of funhouse idea. And the idea that looking at race through this sort of voyeuristic lens. And so each of the shows was a uh, blackophobia, which used sort of the, the, the visual language of horror films mm-hmm. and, and pulp alien invasion movies and stuff like that in race. We lust, which was <laughs> pulling from the visuals of like, I mean, I love like this Times square CD porno theater graphics and all that kind of stuff. And the last one, the other one was uh, Dude, Where's My Ghetto Pass, which was kind of like this, we call it like an urban safari, mm-hmm. you know, so this idea of cultural sort of a, not necessarily appropriation, but like this sort of like, a, everything was about the voyeurism of race, right? Yeah. So once we started thinking about those kinds of things, it was just like, it was just super fun to like kind of riff off of them because our take on on discussing race or presenting race was about the idea of not so much making fun of it, but at least making it less about some of the, the sort of typical things or, or things that people would immediately associate when you're talking about race, particularly at that time. That sh- series was based off of, or that series sprang from a book that we wrote called The Big Book of Racism. And that was a book that Dana Alberella, our beloved editor, who also produced our Ego Trips book of rap lists, she had had moved on from St. Martin's Press to HarperCollins, which was headed by Judith Regan, who was kind of a big shot in the publishing world, particularly at that time. And so we had the opportunity to do to that book called The Big Book of Racism. And our thing about that book was that it was about race because that was our secondary preoccupation after hip hop. The title and the premise kind of started off as a joke, and then we actually kind of started really getting into it. The thing about that book was we wanted to talk about race in a way that people could relate to, because generally when people talked about race, they talked about sort of the history, and we're talking about like the history of race from the arrival of of slaves in America up until the civil rights era. Mm -hmm. And so, and it tended to be very academic. And our lens as far as like how we related to each other and joked with each other was always through the lens of popular culture. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of doing a look at race through the lens of popular culture was an interesting challenge. (laughs) It was a crazy challenge for us. And on top of that, to bring attention to things and to make fun of it or to, to joke about it in that sort of sarcastic sort of coping mechanism kind of way. And it was really hard because we wrote it during 9-11. Oh. Really, yeah. Like, there was a point where, you know, we had started writing the, that book, The Big Book of Racism, and then 9-11 happened, and we're just like, man, we don't hate anybody. You know, we're, we're, yeah. we're, we're critiquing things, but it was very difficult. But we kind of decided if we're going to do this, it's going to be, if we're going to fail, it's going to be a magnificent failure. You know? <laughs> 
we were just like, let's it like it was man, I've never doubted myself as much. I don't and, and perhaps I'm speaking for the rest of the guys when we were doing that thing, because we were just like, should we do this at a time when people needed unity? And we're just writing not so much a divisive book, but a book to sort of, in our minds, illustrate why people of color feel the way they do based off of the treatment that popular culture has presented. And so that was always my interest, personally, was understanding how popular culture affects the perception of people. And so, like I was saying, a lot of the academic books spoke to a very specific audience. And our goal was to be anti-academic, chock full of information, and intended to be sort of ingested sporadically wherever you want to enter it, but to also for you to walk away to understand like, oh, damn, this country is built on race. There's, yeah. there's so much race in this country that people want to not acknowledge. And here's our sort of listicle way of doing it with jokes, <laughs> you know, with comedy, but trying to make it apparent. Like that's the role of an artist is to, to, to make you see things that are right there in front of you. Yeah. Wow. During 9-11. Yeah, that, that was certainly a very interesting I think that was definitely a pivotal point in the country as it relates to race relations. Cause aside yeah. from that, you got the formation of like the TSA and how that has changed just so mm -hmm. many things around screening and airports and stuff like that. But it really like turned the dial on how race relations were in this country. Yeah. It just, it just had a lot, there was a lot of internal examination going on and that tragedy, you know, tragedy sort of exposed you know, what you're made of, right? Yeah. Even just the, the recent craziness that we as a country have been going through the past few years, it's ultimately, I guess, a good thing because it's being brought to light. And then you see where people are trying to reach out and where people are trying to find those commonalities and that common ground and where they're not. And so that's just what emerges. I know that, that you have worked with Ego Trip for a number of years, but during that time, you also were the creative director at Complex for a while. What were some of your memories from that time? I was a creative director after Ego Trip. We had sort of kind of fizzled and disbanded. Okay, um, okay. Yeah. So there was a period where I was kind of back to sort of doing, I was always kind of working on independent projects concurrently while doing ego trip when we when ego trip was in full you know sort of in full rev that's when i spent the most focus on but there were always opportunities to do like album covers or things like that during that time but uh yeah complex kind of came about because i actually our former ego trip intern <laughs> noah was an editor at complex and he sort of um he needed i like to call myself a substitute teacher because the, <laughs> the previous art director had had left and they needed to finish a few issues. And so that's when I kind of came in to work on the magazine. And then what was interesting about working there was I came in and, and sort of helped finish the issues. And I was like, okay, cool. You know, this is fun. Got to work with some younger designers and really start to exercise my kind of delegation and start to teach in some ways or pass along whatever information that I could or, and knowledge that I could to other people and to learn how to shape things. Because, you know, when you're creative, you tend to keep your, to yourself and you do everything that you do things that you don't need to do. Like you don't need to scan. You don't need to, you know, if we're talking about graphic design, you don't need to do the silhouetting. You don't need to do that stuff. You know, maybe you do it, you do it sometimes out of necessity and maybe you, you might get really good at it. But the bigger thing is just really putting all those pieces together. Right. So it was a great exercise to learn how to orchestrate a symphony. Right. And that's kind of why I kind of refer to myself as a creative conductor, because at a certain point, it's less about my actual hands and more about my actual thought and how do you put all those elements together. And so Complex became from a magazine. And this is during start of the, the decline of print as a popular media form and the ascension of the web as the dominant media form, right? And so Complex, all the, the, the business heads behind it were very perceptive in terms of growing that business. And so that's what also kept me there was learning 
I had learned about media when we were doing stuff with VH1, but the opportunity to work with teams of people and to build a business really was exciting. That was an exciting opportunity because now I'm dealing with, for the first time in my life, a generation of people whose references are different than mine. And I'm now in this position of also learning from them. So I like to learn new things and I get excited by new stuff. And I'm always looking for that new drug, you know, like, yo, I want to, I need to get high again. Give me that design crack, you know, give me that culture crack. That was an opportunity to stay plugged in and to learn new things and also to be able to work with people. And also Ego Trip as, as quote unquote successful as we were, we hit a wall in a sense. And going to Complex was an opportunity to sort of flex some different muscles and to see Ego Trip was patronized in the sense that we had VH1 give us money. VH1 give us money, or and before that, the, the book publishers give us money. But we were not successful in the sense of able to generate money ourselves. So Complex was an opportunity to sort of look behind the curtain or actually, and then kind of step behind that curtain and see like how business or how it, entrepreneurial minded business grows and develops and becomes like this media titan that it is today. So that's what kept me there, was to learn from the younger designers to help shape them also, to pass on that information and that knowledge. And they would also show me some things or help me think. You know, I used to say, like, they helped me think, mm, right? Because they, okay. they, they would try different things. And I'd be like, no, 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 no. They would create those different options. I'm a good critic, I think. As a graphic designer or a communication designer or that kind of visual designer, you're taking these kind of existing elements and arranging them versus a, an artist necessarily who kind of creates something from scratch. So they would create these things from scratch in some ways or create these options. And then I can look at them and be like, oh, yeah, no, 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 no. This is not communicating this or this is not tapping into that feeling, you know, that we were talking about before. This is not communicating this thing and helping to shape them. So that was immensely satisfying and, and working with celebrities is interesting and fun and traveling and going around the world is, is great. And so, yeah. How do you define success now? Success is kind of about satisfying the need to create projects that actually propel ideas and culture. And I guess that's maybe always the idea of success for me. I think the idea of monetary success Yes, I'm not going to say that that's not important, but I've come closer to this understanding of, you know, when my time is up for me, what am I putting forth in the world or what's my legacy? And so I can't do everything myself. There are things that I'm working on that are about personal vision, but, but as a group, we can accomplish a lot of things. Ego trip. As a group, we accomplished things that we didn't think we would ever accomplish. As, you know, working at Complex, we accomplished things that were in that, the, the metrics for that world, we surpassed them. And so for me, when people tell me that they've been influenced by something that I did, or they show some sort of appreciation for the things that I've done, and even more so when these things are attached to something that has some sort of cultural importance. Mm -hmm. Man, that's a great feeling. I want to keep doing that. For me, that's the metric of success. Again, love to make money. Nothing wrong with money. Love me some money, you know. <laughs> but we're put on this world to do things. And so I'm happy and fortunate that whatever mark I've made in the world, I've been able to do. You know, I think the thing about it is it's also fleeting and it's also like you got to keep doing things like success is also somewhat short lived. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm, I'm happy to inspire people, but I'm also like I want to inspire more people and I want to and I need to keep doing to continue to be relevant, not because I'm trying to be the cool of the week, but because a large enough body of people are viewing and affected by the things that I work on 
um, right now, that would be the, the marker of success to me. Hmm. That's a very interesting answer. Yeah. I, I, well, I, I guess because, you know, I've, I've been kind of, you know, dropping these little hints like throughout the, the interview, like your work and the work that you did with Ego Trip, the work you did with Complex is really like been a cornerstone in the design style of like when people think of hip hop culture, a lot of that boils down to work that you have done, whether that's with magazines. We didn't even touch on the album covers that you've done. Like, I feel like a lot of people are inspired by your work, but they may not know that it's from you, maybe. Oh, yeah. You know, it's funny. The thing about album covers is because it's still kind of being done in the service of whoever. And I've been fortunate enough to work with people who more or less are like, hey, Brent, I like your style. I had to develop a style because the more you do something, the more people recognize it, right? And Mm -hmm. then if they like it, then they come to you. But in some cases, yeah, I mean, there's been the suppression of ego in the sense of like, it's not about me. It's about like, I'm doing this for someone else. And so, yeah, there's, there's been things that ha- that I've done that maybe people don't see that thread. I have a good friend, Bill McMullen, who he was another designer and he's, you know, some people are really in tune with it. He'll be like, I saw this and I was like, yo, I think Brent did that. Right. And mm-hmm. so he sees it. And so whatever is the essence of me creatively shows up in those things and he's in tune with that and he can find that. And other people, there are other people that can do that too. And so that's a much more honest relationship when you can work with those people, because that means you guys are on the same wavelength. Um, and so that's, I found that those have been the best projects for me is when people come to me because they do know, because they are familiar with the things that I've done. And they're like, that's the vibe that I want. And it's freeing because it lets me be me, you know, like I'm a designer in the sense that I'm problem solving, but I'm also an artist in the sense that like, I'm trying to express something emotionally and I connected with those people. And so, yeah, (laughs) ramble, 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 ramble. (laughs) (laughs) So is there like a dream project that you would love to do one day? I mean, I feel like you, I mean, you've done television you've done magazines you've done album covers you've you know done a book like what's next like what do you really want to do one day there are many dream projects that i want to do there's personal projects that i've finally started initiating one is really getting into furniture design oh okay Um, yeah and so (sighs) i had gone to italy in 2019 to start that working with a friend of mine over there and then um just the nature of the project really meant that i couldn't restart it until the warmer months (laughs) and then 2020 happens and dashes those dreams on the mediterranean rocks that'll still happen and then i have a sort of a creative The dream projects, yeah. I mean, it's really more about, like, when does Brent start putting his own voice forward more, right? Mm. You know, my voice has been forward in people's projects, and mostly because I'd never... I would probably say that if there's one critique of myself, is like I devalue what I think I have to say. I have an idea. I actually started this project during the the pandemia. All I'm going to say is, like, Black Star Wars, and okay. let people kind of go from there. But, you know, you know, I started, I started some stuff and, and making models, telling friends who are also creative and they got super excited about that stuff. And they're like, Oh man, I want to do the soundtrack. And you know, mm. you got to have this character do this and you got to do that. And okay. you know, it'll happen. And I'm not afraid to say it. I thought about like, should I, should I even talk about this? But like, hell yeah. But really, just more personal projects are exciting. I'm my father was a phenomenal creative person mm-hmm. who passed away recently, and my mission, I guess, is to let the world kind of see what this guy who inspired me, what he did, and with the hope that maybe he also inspires other people. So that's also another project. Man, I got a lot of projects going. On. I got a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, like I said, twenty twenty one. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, I let's hear you. Go. 
Well, Brent, just to kind of uh, to wrap things up here, where can our audience find out more about you and about your work and everything online? I guess online you can you can look me up brentrollins.com on my under on my uh, my website that it really needs to be updated. You can follow me on Instagram. My handle is brenttronic, B R E N T R O N I C. And then at that point, by the end of 2021, hopefully you'll be seeing my name in a lot more places when you weren't even trying. Sounds good. Well, Brent yeah. Rollins, I have to thank you just thank you so much for coming on the show. I mean, I I gushed prior to us recording about how much of a of a design influence you've been to me seeing your early work. And it's been just such a pleasure to, one, just introduce you to the Revision Path audience. I have a feeling that people are going to listen to this and they'll be like, wait a minute, he did that? Like, they're going to now know that you're the person behind so much iconic work out there. It's just been a joy to talk to you. It's been a joy to hear about the work that you're doing. And I want to see what comes next. Absolutely. Because I have no doubt it's going to be hot. So thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Man, thank you so much. And I know other people say the same thing to you, man. But like, dude, you're doing God's work. Thank you so much for doing Revision Path. Big, big thanks to Brent Rollins. And of course, thanks to you for listening. You can find out more about Brent and his work through the links in the show notes at revisionpath.com. And of course, thanks to our wonderful sponsor for this episode, Brevity & Wit. Brevity & Wit is a strategy and design firm committed to designing a more inclusive and equitable world. They accomplish this through graphic design, presentations, and workshops around IDEA, Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Accessibility. If you're curious to learn how to combine a passion for IDEA with design, check them out at brevityandwit.com. Brevity and Wit. Creative excellence without the grind. Revision Path is brought to you by Lunch, a multidisciplinary creative studio in Atlanta, Georgia. This podcast is hosted, created, and produced by me, the one and only Maurice Cherry, with engineering and editing by the one and only RJ Basilio. Our intro voiceover is by the man, Music Man Dre, with intro and outro music by the legendary Yellow Speaker. What did you think of this interview? I had a blast talking to Brent, in case you couldn't tell, but I would love to know what you thought about it and what you think about the podcast overall. Of course, you know, we have our listener survey, which I would love for you to take at revisionpath.com forward slash survey. But please do not be a stranger. This is a podcast. This is a conversation between me and the guest and you as the listener. So hit us up anytime on Twitter or on Instagram. Just search for Revision Path and leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. Those ratings and reviews help out a lot because not only do they really help us grow on all these different platforms, Apple Podcasts included, but it lets us reach more people all around the world. I mean, eight years, 400 episodes, that's a lot. So really, it's up to you to really help us out. Like your participation is a big part of how we make all of this grow. As always, thank you so much for listening. 400 episodes. I'm going to keep saying that. That's a huge milestone if no one else celebrates it i will celebrate it so thank you again so much for listening and we will see you next time